Okay, so what we're talking about today are those standards that we mentioned the last time where um, there are, um, it used to be where there were physical representations of these things. So a meter stick and it was a stick that was a meter long and so forth. Um, and they were, people were trying to standardize measurements so that uh, things like a cubic, remember last time a cubic was like the length of your forearm to your fingertips, elbow to fingertip kind of thing, and that's different for everybody. Um, and so that's not a particularly great way to go about measuring things, but it worked for a while. Um, and so at some point, people decided we need to standardize all this stuff. Um, and then they developed these standards, you know, and they, uh, some of them were based on uh, other bigger concepts than themselves at the time. Uh, but they were physically represented. So there was a place where you could go and look at the meter stick and you could go and see the kilogram and things like that. Um, and that at, later on, more recent, much more recently than when the standards were originally adopted, uh, it became clear that, well, over time, even these physical objects are going to change a little bit. Um, and as things started uh, needing to be more and more consistent over time, people started figuring out, okay, instead of um, having a physical thing that we can go look at and measure against, we need to derive these standards from uh, natural phenomena type stuff. And so that's where we're at now. Um, just very recently, all of these standards were updated so much that between last year and this year, the this PowerPoint is different because uh, they were tweaked a little bit. One of them, the kilogram for mass, was uh, finally based on a uh, actual constant versus uh, having the physical kilogram that you went and held. I get well, you couldn't actually hold it. It was much more protected than that. But um, they want to be precisely defined. Uh, but yet they're physical things like length and uh, mass and such. But you want to have a <clears throat> actual precise definition that's not going to change over time. Um, seven different ones. So time, you know, the time is in seconds. And that one actually is the same seconds uh, exist in the SI system and in the U.S. customary system. Uh, kilogram the amount of a thing, so the mole, uh, luminous intensity, so candela, so how bright something is, uh, temperature based on the Kelvin scale, and current. Oh yeah, in length. So, this, and this is how recent, May 20th, 2019, so this is just a few months ago, uh, the, all the, these primary standards were updated, which the last big change to them was, you know, six years ago, nearly. Um, four of the seven were redefined, so these four were redefined, and two were corrected. Um, I mean, these these things, these changes here in your everyday life are not going to make any difference, you know, in, in anything that you currently do. Um, but they, over time, will make things um, more consistent, make things maybe even possible that weren't possible before having something that is as precise as it is now. Um, well, yeah, there we go. Day-to-day -day use remains practically the same. You don't have to go turn in all your calipers or anything like that and get new ones. It's it, it, the, the amount of change between the old and new on a practical level is non-existent. It's lost in the decimal somewhere. Um, but it does make things long-term better. <clears throat> so here's, uh, let's see, where some of these, you need the definitions for this, what delta VCS is. Uh, so, and see, here's the kind of thing that they are going to. So, we're talking about a second now. So, this uh, this numerator divided by this denominator here, where the denominator is the frequency of the radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of cesium-133. So, it's not a thing that you're going to go and go to your dorm room and go measure any of this stuff. But you have to have... Um, a very particular lab set up in a very particular environment to be able to measure these things. But assuming you have the right equipment and the right materials, you could go and uh, 
uh, pro- reproduce these standards. So now there doesn't have to be one. Fi- well, I guess there wasn't a physical second anyway, but um, you don't have to have access to the, the one thing. If that one thing is lost or whatever, or it degrades over time, then it can be recreated now exactly the same way it was created before. Um, oh, and there's the de- uh, the actual numerical value for that denominator. And look at that. It's the same as the numerator. So, so one second is defined as one of these things. Here's kind of a picture of the setup. It doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody that uh, doesn't know exactly what's going on here, but it's maybe just having a picture of it gives you an idea of what they're talking about here as far as recreating one of these things. Um, here it is in a lab set up on a bench top. So that particular one is over in Switzerland. Uh, so it started in 2004 and it has an uncertainty of one second in every 30 million years. That's probably good enough for us for the time <laughs> being. I mean, we'll, we'll be all right for the next little bit. Probably good enough. There is some uncertainty. See, even that, even that, there's some uncertainty in it. So. Uh, it's in, anyway, it's right here. Oh. So, uh, so there was a platinum iridium cylinder. So it was a physical thing and, uh, international prototype kilogram, the IPK. Uh, and it was at, uh, over in France. I actually, uh, we went over there for our honeymoon, not to the, not, not to the <laughs> bureau. <laughs> we, we, we went, <laughs> we went to France, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> she was very excited see the uh, Bureau of Weights and Measurements. But anyway, uh, we didn't go see this thing, but over there, um, and it's a physical place, so that you, I, I assume this thing is probably still there, um, but it's not the standard anymore. <laughs> but uh, Le Grand K. So uh, this is like the the thing, the kilogram. <laughs> and it is um, no longer needed. So this is the one that no, I'm, I guess I want to say fundamentally changed, but it's the one, the, the last one. It was the last one that they couldn't really figure out how to represent with some one of those experimental setups like the second was a second ago. And they uh, recently have devised a way to not need that thing, the actual platinum iridium. Because even even this alloy, you know, it, it will degrade over some amount of time. Um, so... And it was degrading at a measurable rate, so they could actually, um, you know, it's been around, I don't know how long, but a long long enough time that they could detect changes in its mass. Um, So every now and then they went and verify how much it weighed based on uh, how much it weighed before, and it it was changing. So here you can kind of see, it's kind of small, but you can get an idea of, um, over the time. So here it is. It looks like it popped into existence around 1900 or a little before. Uh, and you can see a little bit of change in mass. These are micrograms over here if you can't read that. So um, it's changing in mass over time. Um, and it actually says that it wasn't going away. It was gaining mass. So, you know, so maybe some kind of corrosion or whatever. I don't know. Um, and the IP, the, the original one is losing mass. So there's the there was the original one. I don't know if this picture is the original one or not, but um, there was the original one losing mass, and the ones made from it uh, to match it were gaining mass. Well, and and you have to think about how it's measured, right? So they're probably not gaining mass; they just are losing mass slower than this original one because they're copies of it, so they're newer. Um, and so, but you're weighing it, and you weigh it based on it, you know, because it is the standard. So it looked like it was changing. So it was the one losing mass. The others probably weren't gaining. They just were losing mass slower or had lost less mass. Um, oh, and there it goes. IPK is gaining less mass than the sister copy. So it was not, they weren't doing the same thing. Um, so here's the new definition. I haven't even actually looked at how they've redefined this thing, but uh, these are the type of things that you're dealing with now. Um, you got Planck's constant in there. You've got that um, same denominator that we had before based on the second. Uh, and you have speed of light in the vacuum down here in the C squared part. 
Oh, and there's some numbers for these uh, Planck's constant and the speed of last light in a vacuum. So as far as, and again, <laughs> as we humans, uh, I mean, there could be some among us who, who know better than this, but as far as we know, Planck's constant and this uh, VCS and speed of light, they're constant. Um, and there would be even, there, actually, there would be humans that would argue these are not constant. You know, there's something, uh, speed of light might change or whatever, uh, and so we can time travel. But anyway, um, so as far as we know, these things are constant, and this, now we have a way, this formula, to determine a kilogram without having to have a kilogram to measure from. Uh, we can have these things that we think are universal constants. Um, so here's the amount of a substance. So the old definition is uh, uh, based on carbon-12. And, you know, you get the periodic table here. And new definition is uh, now it looks like we've got Avogadro's constant in there, which would make sense because it's uh, a mole. And there he is. Yeah. Artist rendition. And so a lot of these pictures, I don't know if his is one of them, but there's several of them where um, obviously there was no camera in far enough back. But they they may not have actually been pictures drawn of the person. They were pictures drawn of the person based on descriptions of the person. So, uh, like, I don't know if this is one of them, but a lot of these older pictures were ones where uh, they didn't sit for a drawing because they weren't super famous people at the time. Who's going to go, you know, uh, draw a random guy down the down the road playing with sodium or whatever he's playing with? And, <laughs> But so a lot of them had to be recreated. I don't. We'll have to see if this is one that was recreated or or he actually sat for this. Um. And so it, it again, it doesn't actually change what you would do in chemistry class or anything like that. Uh, there's the luminous intensity. Um. Yeah, just talking about uh, the amount of light that hits the surface of a sphere. Again, you've got all these. There's that's the same set of constants over here. So there's uh, H, C, and delta V. And then now we have the KCD, where this uh, a certain frequency of luminous monochromatic, so one color radiation. Um, temperature, it was based on the triple, triple point of water. Let's see. New definition, again, based on those that set of constants. Uh, well, you have Boltzmann constant in there that wasn't before. Um, current. Uh, this one is interesting to me. So current, you know, electrical current is what we're talking about here. But it's actually based on a, a force measurement. So you got these two wires here. These are parallel conductors. And uh, it is a theoretical thing. You don't, you know, they're not actually here. There's a theoretical thing. So the constant current when you uh, have two straight parallel infinite lengths, so they, there's no uh, end effects. So if, if you had the end of the wire, then the magnetic fields around the end would be kind of weird. Um, so they're infinite length. Uh, and they're really tiny. Neg neg oh, that's hard for me to say. Negligible circular sections. Uh, they're a meter apart, so a meter between these two parallel wires. And again, in a vacuum, we're trying to eliminate any kind of uh, air uh, that would affect these at all. Um, and it's the force between these two wires. So the current necessary to produce this force between these two wires um, is one amp. Um, and so there goes the current flowing through there. They're a meter part. And uh, the, if, if you were able to measure the force between them, you would have one current whenever the force between these two wires pulling them together is two times 10 to the negative seven newtons. Um, there's an equation for uh, calculating this thing, theoretically. And so that's what they're trying to do is make it to where they're all theoretical equations based on constants. Um, there's the, uh, you know, the old meter, uh, one ten millionth of the distance between the North Pole and uh, equator at the longitude, uh, between the North Pole and the equator uh, going through Paris. So I had to go through Paris. <laughs> well, they didn't have any idea about continental drift or anything like that. Uh, so 
again, it's new now. This one is light. You know, it's how far does light travel in a vacuum over a certain period of time. So um, if you noticed, oh, I don't really want to go back and maybe it'll pop up again. So there's an actual, you know, prototype meter, actual made again of the platinum iridium. Um, the this. Yeah, it it is. It's uh, how far does the speed, how far does a light uh, a photon move in one uh, in one meter? Uh, how, how how do I say that? Yeah, how long does it take? So they, they measure the time and however far that photon moves is a meter. Um, so what I was going to say is that um, notice a lot of these are dependent on another one of them. So this one is dependent dependent on well not this one but the meter is dependent on the uh, definition of time because it's how far does the particle move or well the the photon move in amount of time uh, defines the meter and so there's a um, odd odd relationship between standards that are based on you know kind of this interbreeding of the standards um, and then there's there's other things like the U.S. system has to relate to this one somehow. So the U.S. system, um, I don't remember when it was, but, uh, you know, you kind of find it odd that an inch is 2.54 centimeters. You know, why is it, uh, you know, why that number? And so it turned out that I think it's maybe in the 60s. I had to look it up a while back. Uh, it was just defined that way. So it was close enough to that. And they were like, well, all right, let's chop it off and define an inch in terms of centimeters, which are meters, which has a definition. Now, at the time, it was a different definition. But um, now our system kind of has a standard relationship between the uh, SI system, which has these type of standards. Um, all right. So here's the idea where you have to reproduce these things. So if a standard cannot be reproduced in a lab, it's a fixed standard. So at the time, mass uh, was one of those. Now it uh, can be reproduced a few, as of a few months ago. Um, now everything in a properly equipped lab, and properly means properly for that particular thing. It's not just like a good lab. Uh, it's a properly equipped place explicitly for producing these standards. Um, and it's not, yeah, it's not going to be stuff that you just have laying around. You can't go uh, to Lowe's and buy all this stuff. You need to build one of these. So it's not practical. So they make secondary standards. So these are um, there. They do have a couple. Maybe, I don't know how many, but there are places that can produce the primary standards. And then secondary standards are made to match those. So the secondary one might be more of a physical thing. Like it might be a meter stick or a kilogram mass or whatever. Um, but it's produced based on the primary standard. So there's some error between them, right? Because uh, it's a copy of the original. Uh, and then there can even be tertiary standards. Um, so here's some gauge blocks. I don't, these are actually really cool if you've never seen one of these. Um, they see how he's twisting it together. When you twist them in place and they are matching kind of like the 10 and 20 are, then you can't pull them apart. Like there's atomic like van der Waal forces between those two holding them together. And that's why he's having to twist them. You have to twist them to shear those forces because you can't pull them apart in tension. Um, I don't know. Maybe you could if you pulled hard enough. But uh, in general, you don't. They're, they're actually really cool. So this is how uh, you might measure some distance. So this one, I guess, is 20 millimeters, 10 millimeters. And that one's, I don't know, 40 millimeters maybe. Um, and so they come in different gauges and it's, uh, you can use them for measuring distance. Um, here's a weight set. You've seen something like that in uh, your physics class and chem chemistry classes and the science classes in high school. You've seen this kind of thing before. <clears throat> um, and so, and these could be secondary standards or, you know, depending on how far away it's okay to be from the standard, there can be tertiary standards and so forth. So tertiary would be um, like maybe a set of calipers that are calibrated based on a secondary uh, standard like this. And so and then they go use the calipers to measure whatever they're measuring. I don't know, but um, they can be le multiple levels of uh, distance between the original 
primary standard and what you're using to uh, produce whatever you're making. Oh, that was him. Um, well, there's that. There was that thing I wanted to see. See how these little arrows? So it shows how some of these are dependent on other of the standards. Uh, and so it's kind of this odd thing where uh, if you don't have ways to uh, definitely, definitively define the standard, then you have error producing the other standards that depend on that standard. So that's one of these things where they were trying to uh, standardize everything. All right. So this kind of information there on exam one, there will be some kind of questions, you know, maybe fill in the blank for multiple choice type things. Um, not the equation side of these. So I'm not going to ask you to memorize the equations to produce these standards. Um, but there'll be something, some informational type thing about this standard. Um, and not a lot of it, just a little bit. Anyway, so that's that's kind of where we're coming from. We are doing measurements based on these standards. We are many, many uh, levels away from the primary standards with what we're going to be measuring, but uh, they do exist. Um, first, what we're going to do, since we're still not 100% sure that everybody, I get a little email at the end of, I don't know, every other day or so that tells me everybody that's bought one of the kits. Um, and there were a lot of people that have, like on after class last time, must have went and bought it because there were, I don't know, 20 or 30 names on the list. Um, there's two sections of this, though, so they weren't all from here. Um, so we don't all have the kit necessarily yet. And so once we all get the kit, um, I'll do a little soldering demonstration because one of the first things we have to do is solder up that uh, SD card shield. Um, but for now, we can work on some Python. So I, on this computer, I have Thonny somewhere. There it is right there. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Oh, I already have a program in here testing it out. All right, so let's delete that. Oh, let's just do file new. There we go. Uh, we can close that one. Um, so Python is a little bit different. Unless you've used Python before, it's a little bit different from the languages you might have used. So I know you've used some kind of Arduino sketch, which we'll use. We'll have to you write both sets of code. So we'll have to write some sketch for the Arduino because it's going to be sitting there recording the data, maybe even doing a little bit of processing on the data, mainly recording it though. Um, we'll probably leave all the processing for the Python script that deals with it, but I don't know, maybe, maybe something will get processed on the Arduino, but we'll have to write some Arduino code. And I know you've done some amount of that before, even if it was last year, but you've done some of that or two years ago, maybe. Um, but we probably haven't done a lot of Python code. So they actually look kind of similar. They're both um, lower level languages. Well, higher. I, I always get this backwards. Um, they are less. Um, I mean, they're actually pretty clear in what they say. They actually use words. It's not not a set of symbols or hexadecimal code or something like that. It's stuff you can read. Uh, it's also an interpreted language, so you don't have to compile it. Um, you know, when you ran an Arduino sketch, you ch check the button or whatever, the, the symbol to compile and run. Um, so it had to actually go in and uh, process all the code you wrote, put it in a little package, and send that to the Arduino and let it run. Um, Python runs on the fly, so it kind of compiles it on the fly. It doesn't compile it. So you can compile a Python code. Compiling means... Um, you write it in a language, the one you type in, and then it gets translated into something that the computer can understand. Normally, that makes it run faster. So the um, um, Python kind of does that on the fly, though. Oops. Go back. Um, and so it can look about the same. You know, it's going to have words like print and uh, seen things, commands you've seen before. It might look a little bit different in the formatting. Um, it is super dependent on one thing that the Arduino sketches are not. So the Arduino sketches, you could indent and space over and you know write stuff kind of wherever you wanted to. Python um, relies on indention, like indenting your text or the code 
uh, certain numbers of spaces. It relies on that to know when things are in loops or when things are in functions or whatever. Uh, and so you can't just randomly space things over. Um, and you kind of need to make a choice on, are you going to use the tab key to indent or you want to hit the space bar to indent because it doesn't do too well mixing them. In fact, I don't know if Thani does because I haven't used it that much, but a lot of Python editors have a command where you can highlight text and uh, convert spaces to tabs or convert, uh, remove indention or all that because it's such a big deal uh, as far as um, hard to track down if you've mixed in tabs and spaces. Maybe you hit space four or five times, but your tab is six spaces or whatever, and they look all the same. Um, it can be... Uh, a pain if you're not careful with indenting things. So that's that's going to be probably the biggest difference that you'll notice. Uh, and I, let's see if uh, I don't see here. Normally, there's some kind of way to. Um, well, a lot of these editors have a way to help you with the indentions or not. Um, I don't see one in Thani, but it's okay. Just make sure you just decide something. I'm going to tab is probably your better bet because um, the space bar, you'd have to hit it like four or five times uh, and you might uh, sometimes do four, sometimes do five and it's going to get really confused. So tab is probably your best thing. Um, so let's just take this first one. So this is, it's just a text file. This is a Python code. So all of these, uh, whatever you want to call them now, they were the pound symbol when I was your age. Now they're hashtags. They're actually, does anybody know their actual name? Yeah, Octothorpe. So if you look at them really close, there's eight points on them, so Octo. And so they're actually Octothorpes. But um, nobody I knew ever called them that. But uh, whatever you want to call them, they just set up uh, comments in here. So they're, uh, what was the comment in Arduino? Slash or something like that. Yeah, the little slash thing. Um, so, yeah, the double one. Yeah. So they're kind of the equivalent to that. Um, and so if most of these lines are just, you know, you got your header up here. Sometimes uh, when these codes are bigger inside this header, you want to define variables uh, that you've used in the thing so that you don't have to try and figure out what the variable is in the body of the code itself. This one, you know, it has X and Y in there as a variable. So you might go in inside this header and put X equals whatever and Y equals whatever uh, just to help your own self out. Or particularly if you're coding this and uh, other people are going to come back to it later, or even if you're going to come back to it later, it, it just makes the process of editing this thing later easier. Um, so I'm just going to copy this. I'm just going to edit, you know, like control C, control V. So copy it and well, I don't want to paste it yet. Let's paste it into here. So here's my Thani window. I've got a blank one up here. Control V. And it does format it. So, you know, I've got some, it does some of the color coding. I think Arduino, most Arduino editors do that too, if I remember right. Um, and that just kind of gives you a clue that, hey, some of these commands are uh, correct. Um, it doesn't, you know, it kind of grayed out to this particular one anyway. Let's see if I can make that bigger. I wonder if there's an option for font size in here. Let's see. There's usually some view. Increase font size. All right. Of course, it goes off the screen then. So I can't do it any time. It was control plus. That didn't work. View. Let's do it again. All right, so that's about as big as we can make that one and still fit over here. I don't know what the assistant does. Let's see. Sometimes if you, well, I don't know. Anyway, um, this one. So if you caught the, copy this in and run it, there's a really good chance that it's not going to run. Um, because this very first line of code, anyway, not the lines of comments, but the line of code, the one highlighted there, is an import. So import means hey, this program that I wrote is not going to work unless you have this other program that somebody else wrote, or, or maybe one that you wrote. So Thani, at least my version of Thani, did not have this library, this matplotlib, 
uh, it didn't have that library built into it. Now I know that's on my computer because it works in my other version of Python, but Thani didn't know where it was. So what I did to make Thani know was, let's see, I went to tools, manage packages. So this is, uh, you have to be connected to the internet for this to work because it's gonna go out to uh, Py, P, I or what, PL, whatever that is, Python libraries. Um, and I typed in mat lock, lock. And I said, find package. Yeah, and there was a Jedi in there. All right, and so it finds one and uh, it says, all right, this is the latest stable version, 3.11. Sometimes there might be more than one of these. Mine says uninstall because I already installed this one. Yours should say um, install right here where mine says upgrade. Um, you click on that. Assuming you're connected to the internet, it found it, and it will, it actually took a while for it to download. It's not a big library, but yeah, yeah, you want to, your, any code that you have, like this one over here, uh, map plot library, which we're going to do lots of plotting and basic measurements, there'll be lots of plotting, so you will use that library quite a bit. Um, and it took a while, longer than I thought, for it to download, like a minute, so not terribly long, but uh it should be like 10 seconds. So I don't know why mine was so, going so slow. But it should install it. It'll pop up a window and um, download a couple of things. Some of them aren't that exact name, but they're related to it. Maybe it has other functions that it includes. I don't know. Um, and then once you have that, uh, I think there's probably a close button or something. Then we can go back over here. And now it kind of looks like the Arduino up here at the top. I've got a run button. But there's no compile button because I don't compile it. So I just run it and then it'll, oh, if you haven't saved it, then it will force you to save it. So I already did save it once. Now it runs and it, now we can kind of look through here and see what these lines of code are doing. So I've got X and Y. Uh, those are basically ordered pairs for this plot with the three points on it. Um, then, oh, let's, let's explain a little bit of this. So import matplotlibrary.pyplot as PLT. So the library has this long name. Um, we want the matplotlibrary in pyplot. And we are going to say instead, I don't want to write that all the time. It's too long. So I'm going to import it as PLT. So I shortened it. The as PLT part, you could put pretty much anything in there, uh, anything you wanted to shorten it to. Um, PLT kind of makes sense because it's plot. looks like plot. I guess you could probably put PLOT and make it even more clear. Oh, no, no. So you could not put PLOT because that's an actual function. Uh, and so it would be confusing or it, I don't know what it would do. It, it would probably throw some kind of errors because it wouldn't make sense. Um, it would be kind of similar to um, importing it as print or something like that. And it's like, what do you mean print the command I already know, but but you want this thing to be that <laughs> command? So we get confused. So this this little import as needs to be something that's not already used. Um, and, but all it does is it makes it where you don't have to type this every time. You can type PLT instead. So every time you see PLT in here, like right here, it's basically referencing this whole um, label. All right, so I've got a set of ordered pairs. I'm going to create a figure, uh, and then I'm going to uh, plot, do the matplot library pi plot, create a subplot one one, um, and then I'm going to add data to the plot. X and Y are these two sets of data points. So one two, there's one two, uh, two four, next set, and then three one is the final set. So if we added another one, uh, five. And let's see, uh, two. It doesn't matter. This space right here doesn't matter, but I like it to line up evenly. Now, see, we have a new plot in there. By this, my five two data point. Um, and we didn't change anything else. We didn't. There was a, not a for next loop or anything that had to count. It just plotted all of the data in the x and y set. Now, it would probably give me problems if they were not equal. I don't know actually what will happen. Let's find out. Let's see. All right, so now here's an error. So in, in Thani, and most editors, you get an error 
I don't know, make it, uh, it's very sensitive to where that's at. Um, so, so look, I get all of this because I added that zero. So um, you can kind of, there we go. Usually the very last line is the one that's going to be most useful for what's going on. A lot of times it'll give you an error, a line number where there was a problem, but it says, oh, X and Y have to have the same first dimension, uh, but they have this shape and blah, blah, blah. So the kind of gives you a clue that, hey, there's something wrong with the way I defined X and Y, and it's that they don't match up. So there will be some editing or troubleshooting that you have to do. Does anybody know the origin of the word troubleshoot? It's kind of interesting. No, no, nobody knows the origin of troubleshoot. Yes, <laughs> like in the old west. Well, now there's kind of there's kind of two possible origins. One of them is um, one of them has to do with telephone lines and people messing with telephone lines. Another one has to do with um, shooting troublemakers. So, so don't be a troublemaker. All right. Uh, let's see. Here you can kind of see. Oh well, if I open up my my wind, no, not that window. Where'd my, oh, I guess it didn't run because uh, we had that error. Let's run it again. All right. So you can kind of see over here where you've got the green text. Those are in quote, single quotes. Um, Python probably doesn't care if you have single or double quotes. I'm not super sure on that. We could try it out, but uh, let's, see. Let's, see. let's see if it cares. A lot of times Python is uh, pretty resilient, but there are some things it cares about. Let's see if it cares if you have single. Didn't look like it mattered. Nope. All right. So single and double don't make any difference uh, here. So that that's okay. Um, and you can see where it put X, Y, and my first graph across the title there. And then the little final line here is show. So um, this subplot, this one one, that's the only one that's maybe not uh, obvious what it's doing. But what's going on here is there's subplots. So subplots usually means that I've got a plot and other plots inside it or whatever. And that's exactly what this means. Uh, you can have one big plot with multiple little plots inside of it. And so one one just basically is there's one plot. Um, I have a grid of one by one, more or less. Uh, but I could have, I won't, uh, you know, I could change these numbers. I don't know what will happen since I don't have other subplots in here, but let's do two, two and see um, what it actually does. Since I don't have any others, it may still just put, plot the one, but let's see. No, nope, it doesn't like that at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, so sometimes you get like, I don't know, num pi, so that's a, a pi Python, and there's an array, um, has no attributes. So I tried to create basically a two by two set of plots, but I only gave it one plot and it didn't like that. Oh, the system over here kind of gives you some idea. Um, all right, so let's just go back to one more. All right, and make sure we did, we're back to running. All right, there we go, and there's our one plot. All right, so let's grab the next, that was, that was in Moodle, that was the uh, first one. That was plot one. Let's do plot two. Let's see what it looks like. All right, so we got a few more lines here. Um, now I have line one and line two, so it looks like I'm going to plot uh, two separate lines. I still have my subplots as one one, so that probably is one plot with two lines on the same plot. Um, and I've got some label. It actually says two. Let's fix that. Two lines. Oh, I can't edit it here. Let's get it into... Uh, All right, let's make a new one. Oh, and also, um, you do have kind of like in the Arduino setup, you do have tabs across here. So there's the old one. I want to close it. I don't want any more. We have to save this one. So let's file, save as, um, let's call it plot two. Um, I've created a little folder. You'll end up with a lot of pieces of code. So um, by the end of the quarter, you'll want to have a decent way of organizing these things um, because you'll have lots of little pieces of code that you're going to use throughout the quarter. All right, so let's see. We've got, again, we had to import this. 
that's going to be true anytime you want to make a plot using uh, the PyPlot library. So we have to import that. You don't have to go and reinstall the library that you grabbed unless you uninstalled it for some reason. So you only have to install the libraries once and then um, they should be there until you want to update them or erase them. So we have two lines or two sets of ordered pairs. One plot um, have two labels here, one for line one, one for line two. Um, then the, the axis labels and the title. Uh, oh, this one's going to add a legend. So we're going to see what, uh, what line is what. All right. Now, this one, we did not define the colors in here anywhere. Nope. Um, so this just is the, I don't know if you end up with the same two colors that I end up with, or it's random, or they're just different colors. I don't know if those are the first two colors it autom automatically defaults to or not. Um, probably is, but I don't know that. Um, here's our legend, our title, there's our two plots, um, our two uh, lines, if you want to call them that. And we've still got the one big plot, though. Um, so the new thing here is that I've got two plots. There's their data sets. And then I've got a legend on the thing. So these little bits of code will be useful. I don't want to close that. These will be useful uh, templates for when you do want to create some kind of plot. You can probably go find one of these. You might even label them something more or save them as something more meaningful than plot one, two, three, and four. Um, you might save them as, hey, this is a single plot with a line on it. This is a plot with two lines on it and so forth. Um, so let's see what plot three is going to do. Um, not much longer. Let's see what we've got. No, we've got colors now. So now we can, uh, and line type. So instead of just solid lines, we have dashed and how big they are, uh, what kind of symbols are at the data points. Um, so we've got a lot more detail here. I've got one plot again, just there's six data points on it instead of three. Um, some different title, but uh, everything else looks about the same. We took off the legend. All right, so let's copy this. Put it over here. Actually, file new. Put it in there. Save it. It'll be plot three for me. Okay, and let's see what this one looks like. Look at that. So we've got blue dots. So there's the marker face colors, blue. Um, marker is, we're using the lowercase letter O. What if we change it to uppercase A? Oh, I didn't like that. Oh, you know what? There are only certain markers. Let's see. Um, there's a dash, I think. No? Uh, well, what are they? Plus symbol? Does a plus work? There we go. We can do plus symbols. X works. O works. I don't know what all they all are. O looks good though. Let's do O. All right, and they're kind of big because we made the marker size at 12. Um, line width, the, the dashed line is three, so it's a little thicker than it was before. We made it green. Uh, dashed is the dotted line or dashed line here. Um, we also, this is different, we didn't have this last time, so we have the X and Y limits, what the range is going to be for the graph itself. Um, so we set those at 8, even though, uh, you know, our last data point's at 6. So we, we can force the um, graph to be a certain size. I'm not 100% sure what happens if we make this smaller than, uh, wait, that's the Y change the text to five and see what it decides to do. Yeah, it just didn't plot the other ones. You know, there's there's one over here that's the sixth data point. It just didn't plot it because we chopped it off at five. All right. Whoops. Oh, let's see. If it, I don't actually have anything. Oh, here's a... I don't know if this... Let's see. So notice how this is really all one line. Line 17 and 18 are really, really all one line. Sometimes there are special things uh, to make that happen. Um, I can't tell here. If it's, I think it's automatically doing it, though. Donnie is. 
No, no, because it looks like. All right, so let me see if we can recreate this. So here's what you would have typed. Um, that would work, should work anyway. All right, so that works. Um, but they have it on the next line. So if I hit enter, okay, Thani does um, when you have a continued line, like you don't want it to scroll forever to the right. Um, I hit enter there and it did indent it and actually attach it to that previous line. So that's that's handy. Sometimes that's a manual thing that you have to do uh, if you want lines to wrap around uh, without scrolling so far. So Thani handled that pretty well. That's good. All right. Um, let's get a new one. So four. All right. Oh, we have bars now. So this one would be if we want to plot a bar graph or histogram or something like that. Um, so we've got uh, different heights. Looks like we're going to have five different bars. Uh, they're just labeled one through five. Um, actually, they're labeled in the words one through five down here. Um, and this is just their positioning. Um, still have the one plot. And um, got a couple of different things that we're going to have red and green. Uh, make them 0.8. I don't know what units that is for the 0.8. Uh, let's find out. Let's see, one of these buttons there is new. All right. And let's save it. Oh, save it as four. All right, and let's see what we get. All right, so it's alternating red and green because we only gave it two colors, but we gave it more than two bars to plot, so it just alternates them. Um, point eight is actually, that looks like maybe it's supposed to be in the uh, inch range or whatever, because that's pretty wide. Um, what else did it put on here? Well, X and axis and Y axis label is the chart title. Um, Let's make this smaller. See how sensitive it is. 0.5. And I assume that if we added a third color, it would uh, just have a pattern. There's probably a way to adjust the spacing between them as well. All right, let's see. Let's add another color. So we've got red, green. Let's add blue. All right. And that should do it. Yeah, so, and if we had another one, it would just make it blue. So it just kind of um, alternates the pattern. Um, when you're making plots like this, bar graphs, and you're relying on color to tell stuff apart, normally they're, you know, they're shoved up really close to one another. And be careful using color uh, because it only looks good on your computer screen. And if you happen to print it out in color and assuming you're not colorblind. <laughs> so normally when you're making plots that rely on some kind of color, you want a pattern not a color. I mean, you can have the color, but it's better if you also have, you know, a solid and a striped and a dotted or whatever. So there are patterns too. So because you never know if somebody's going to copy this thing in black and white and it all looks great or whoever's looking at it is colorblind and can't see red, green very well distinctly. So um, if you're relying on color to separate, then that's probably not enough. You want to rely on color and something else um, just as an aside there. Let's see. What do we got? Number five. All right, so we have a lot more stuff here. More data points. Um, oh, it looks like we're going to create a histogram because I see bins. So um, bins are going to be how many bars are you going to have in your histogram? Now, 10 is probably a lot for this size data. You know, normally, if this is the number of data points you have, you don't make a histogram because it's not enough. Um, the, the general rule for histogram is that you want at least six bins. Um, and that's not a hard and fast. That's just kind of general. Uh, and you want the number of bins to be around the square root of the number of samples you have. So if you have 36 samples, you want to have six bins. Um, and then you divide the width of the bins based on what the range of the data is. But um, so this one's probably not going to look that great, but because uh, we don't have that many data points. Well, let's see what it looks like. So new, paste, save.
And let's see what we get. Actually, that doesn't look too bad, except that you see there's a whole bunch of them that are basically the same. And then there's one in the middle that's uh, peaked. Um, all right, let's, let's redo this one with only six bins and see if we it looks any better. Again, it's a really small sample size, so it's not going to look great. But now you can kind of see, oh, it's maybe skewed right a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of a tail on the right side, but uh, kind of hard to tell. Uh, so really, this one, you would need more data. Normally, uh, any, any data set that you want to run some kind of statistics thing on, you probably ought to have at least 40 samples in the set uh, to get started with something that means anything. There are ways to make uh, some kind of analysis on really small data sets, but the uncertainty levels are so big that it typically doesn't mean much. Uh, let's see. So what is going on in here? We've got our data. So we could add more numbers in there to make it a bigger data set. Um, there's our range. Um, you could calculate the range from the data itself with a min and max function if you wanted to. This one just defines it uh, because it's ages. So in general, you know, nobody's going to be less than zero. And, you know, it's going to be tough to get over 100, although you could. Um, and then you've got the formatting of the actual histogram over here. Apparently, there's more types of histograms that you can create. This one is a bar. Not sure what. Maybe wonder what happens if there's a line one. I don't know. Oh, it might be um, Pareto. Might be the other. Yeah. Let's see about the other one. <laughs> Not Pareto. Or maybe I can't spell. Anyway, R works. A lot of these options, you just, oops. A lot of these options, you have to go and dig in the documentation to see what they all are. Um, I, don't ex I don't really expect you to even, in a test type environment, write code from scratch. Um, at least not a lot. I might give you a printout of code and ask you what it does, but I'm, I'm generally not, you're not computer scientists, or I mean, some of you might have a minor in that, I don't know. But um, in general, I don't expect you to remember all the little details of writing code. I don't remember it all. I have to go like test things out or, or find an example or uh, look up a, you know, go to a reference page somewhere. Um, but you will have like, it's possible that you get a piece of code like this and I ask you to roughly generate its output. You know, what kind of chart would this look like more or less if you ran this code? I'm not going to try and be tricky like, oh, there was uh, a space over here and it wouldn't run at all. You know, I'm not going to really do that. Um, but, uh, you know, something like, something like this where we're on six. Yeah. You get this and I ask you, what's the output of this? Assuming everything runs correctly and you have this library, blah, blah, blah. What's this output? You know, and you don't have to be exact. I don't, I'm not worried if that you're exactly right, but that you know more or less what's going on. But uh, you will write code, but it's going to be more homework project type stuff versus on an exam. All right, let's see what we got here. So we've got uh, two sets, larger sets of data. Um, we still have the 1-1 one, one subplot. I don't know if any of these are going to give us multiple plots or not. Um, oh, we're using stars. So stars uh, for the label. Oh, no, that's label, not the marker. Marker, we're using the asterisk. Um, I think S30. Hmm. Not sure what that does. We'll have to see. Uh, we got a label, legend on this one also. So there's all the little stars. I don't know what the S30 switch is doing, though. It's a scatter plot S30. Hmm. All right. So in that case, you have to, unless somebody knows, you have to go to, well, is it? Yeah. Oh, they were pretty tiny already. So 30 must be like pixels. Well, not even pixels. I don't know what that is. All right. So that's another way to find things out is just change it and see what happens. Oh, they're not okay. It actually, all right.
Yeah, it's a very uh, small change, but it does make them bigger. One million. One hundred. Yeah, it makes them bigger. All right, so their unit systems seem to be kind of all over the place and, and re relatively. Oh, 30,000? It works. All right, so 30,000. <laughs> There we go. It makes them bigger. Not sure why that. Oh, that's the legend one up there. All right. The legend. All right. So, S must be size. I wonder if that is a shortcut for size, like you can use it other places where you use size. I don't know. Uh, oh, one more of these, and then we have custom functions. What time is it? Yeah, we got time. Um, all right. So, all of these are just on the 1 1 plot. We'll I guess we'll do it. All right, we gotta save that. Seven plot. Let's see what we have here. I see radio. Oh, it's a pie. Oh, wow, that's fancy. I don't like how the legend overlaps it. I want can't. It's not dynamic. You can't move it over. Um, and so your font contrast is is bad on the screen. So it'd be horrible when you print it out. Like there's there's a number in that blue one that. You can barely read when it's on the screen, so you can be certain you wouldn't read it well on paper. Um, so let's look through this. We've got um, four different activities, and then we have their relative weights here. Um, I think these relative weights uh, don't have to add to any particular number. It's just they're re they're relative to one another. So a like three parts out of whatever that sum is. Um, Oh, we've got shortcuts for the color. Let's change the blue because it was uh, hard to read. Um, we already have red, yellow, and green. Um, white probably won't. Well, we might make go an outline. Let's see. Yeah, no, it doesn't do an outline. There's probably a border option that we can turn on. Anyway, there's. Wonder, wonder if it has teal. I don't know what all colors it has. Nope, it doesn't have teal. <laughs> R. Well, I think R is red. <laughs> there we go. So we made the, the change that font color to white so it can be readable. Uh, we have the one plot. Um, we have a pie chart so you can see that it's pie. Um, purple is not? Man. Violet, yeah. Maybe it's like R. Or, oh, wow. Don't have to, but maybe some of them you do have to type out. Maybe they don't have a shortcut. Maybe cyan. Yeah, so cyan is one. <laughs> oh, so some of them don't have the short abbreviation, so you have to type them out. Um, cyan works. I can at least see that on the screen. I don't know how well it worked to print. And magenta and all these kinds of things. Beige, tan. <laughs> Um, so I can look the explode thing here. Notice one of them was peeled away a little bit. So you can pick which one to explode by what. I don't know if that's a, you know, this one is point one. So I don't know what the point one reference is. Sometimes on what they reference, like the stars, you had to make it a giant number to have any effect. Point one here to make this thing slide out from the pie. Oh, so it's the order. Um, so the activities are ordered here, and it's the same order here. <laughs> There's so many activities <laughs> we can do. So the whatever's in the third spot in your array here gets pulled out, and you can pull them all out. You know. Yeah. So I'll pull out uh, sleep by more, and so it should pull it out. Uh oh. Whoa. Oh, I put a comma too. Never mind. And so it pulls it out by more. So you can pull them all out if you want to. Or they can all be stuck together. Um, this looks like a formatting thing um, that I want to have a, a decimal place on this number. So Python and variables, notice I haven't had any things here where I had to say integer or float or uh, string or I didn't define any of these variables. 
Um, when you do that, that's called type casting. So you are casting this variable as a certain type. Python doesn't do that. Python in, infers what you meant. So uh, if I put slices and I put numbers in there and they all look like integers, it assumes that, oh, you mean that slices is an integer. If you ever add a decimal into slices, then all of a sudden slices is a float. Um, if you mix stuff, then I don't know what it would do. But um, here, I didn't have to tell it that these were strings. It just said, hey, you only put strings in here. That must be a string variable. So Python doesn't, in fact, often want you to um, typecast your variables. It just wants you to put the variable in, make sure they all make sense together so you don't mix things up. Um, and then it will handle any kind of uh, typecasting that needs to happen in the background. Uh, I'm not sure what it does in the background, but you don't tell it up front that this is an integer or a float or a precision, whatever. You don't tell it that. Let's see. All right, so here, this, these three custom functions. All right, so this is an example. This one I don't think actually does anything. I think save this let's oh wait let's copy it put it over here i don't think it's actually going to do anything um if we run it let's see yeah it doesn't oh well we got to save it got to save it oh wow caps lock is on all right let's see if it does anything i don't think yeah so it so this custom function, this thing we downloaded, it doesn't actually do anything um, on its own. It is a library, it's like the PyLab, PyLab <laughs> that we imported for our previous thing. This is a similar deal to that, where it itself doesn't do anything, but it adds, in this case, custom functions. So if we look through it, we can kind of see what kind of functions it's adding. Um, there's a temperature conversion. So I can input a value, input a unit, and ask for the output unit. So I can say uh, 32 Fahrenheit, I want it in Celsius, and it'll give me zero. So um, oh, actually, it looks like my options are Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. Yeah, and it has the built-in conversions to get between them. There's Rankin even. Um, let's see what else is in here. Is it only temperature? No, there's a, oh, all right. So here's a CSV. What's CSV? It's a comma separated value values list. So it's the um, just a list of data of some type. And the thing that separates all the data points or pieces uh, is commas. So comma C uh, separated value. And it's going to make it into a list. So this function makes that into a list um, based on where the commas are. Um, Let's see what it's there. Max index. So it just finds the index is the number. You remember, um, we haven't really talked about that, but in an array uh, of data, you have each position is an index. Maybe if you remember from MathCAD, if you've done a good bit of MathCAD, you can sometimes use the index variable uh, to specify which data point you want to do some kind of operation on. Uh, normally, zero is the uh, leftmost data point in an array. And then it goes, you know, consecutively after that up to whatever you set it to. Um, and so this will actually find the maximum index in a piece of data. There's the minimum. Oh, maybe it's the index. Maybe this is actually returning the index of the. All right. So I said that wrong. Um, if I read the things here, it would tell me this one returns the index of the maximum value. So you've got a list that's not ordered. Uh, so it's just random numbers. Uh, and they're not uh, in ascending or descending order, this one will look through the whole list and find the maximum value and then return the index number of that position or that data point. And then there's a min one too, min index. Um, so what this does is nothing. But you can pair it with, let's see, here's a test. So import, custom. now here we have to be careful I didn't name it custom functions with a capital F and a lowercase c, so we might need to go rename ours exactly to match that. 
um, because I think I used actually I think I was in caps right so it was all all wrong so let's actually save as the exact same now I don't know what's going to happen um, well, let's just try it. I don't know. I'm going to, yes, I want to replace it, but I want it to look the way I have it. Um, it didn't actually do that. Well, we'll see. Let's, let's just load this other thing up and see what happens. We probably will get some kind of errors. We'll see if we can figure them out. All right. So it wants to find custom functions. I, I'm going to save these two in the same folder, and that should... I don't want to install this thing as a library uh, or what do they call it here a, a package um, so I'm just going to keep custom functions in the same folder that I save this thing in so let's and it's still capital that's probably not going to be good for me custom text. actually let's go back to that folder oh where'd it go uh, Let's do this. Let's see if we can rename this. Sometimes, and I don't remember right now, these have to have, this custom function has to have a certain extension. Like for, for Arduino, it was a dot H, I think. Um, let's just see what happens. All right. <laughs> yes, replace it. it uh, I may have to delete that other one. I don't know. Let's see. Looks like that was modified outside of Thonny. Do you want to discard the current editor and reload the file from disk? Sure. Don't know what that did. Um, no, no. Let's see. Uh oh. So tempcon is not in custom functions. So either it didn't find it, or it's not in there. So, oh, all right. So let's let's do this. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Yeah, it did. It did some weird stuff. All right. What are you doing? All right. File. Save this one as test. All right. This one is not doing anything right. Let's go get our actual custom functions here. New, <coughs> paste that, save it as that. I think I must have been on the wrong tab when I saved one of these at one time. All right, so test is now that. Custom functions, does it have a temp? Con in it. Yes, TempCon is in there. Let's run that one. Hey, it worked. All right. So I didn't have to do anything special other than name them the right thing and put them in the same folder. Um, and it went and found custom functions. Uh, it imported it as CF, so you don't have to write custom functions every time you want to use it. So there's all the references to it. And then here's all the inputs. So we're converting 100 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So there's the 212. Uh, zero Celsius to Fahrenheit, there's 32, 273.15 Kelvin to Fahrenheit, so there's the 32, and so looks like it's working. Um, actually, it doesn't like these last ones, though. Um, oh, because look, it's got a B and a C and a D, and it doesn't know what to do with B, C, or D in in the temperature conversion. Um, boy, it knows what to do with C. It doesn't know what to do with B or D, um, because there's no done in here so what it does is it falls into this else so all of these are here's the function I called built into custom functions and then a bunch of if statements so if the input unit which oh this might be different stuff this line might be different from stuff you did in Arduino so what this line is doing is this is a function so it is um, a container for other code um, and its name is temperature conversion, tempcon, uh, and it has three inputs. So input value, input unit, and output unit. Um, 
So those are all pieces of information that you need to put into this function for it to operate on. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see when we actually do our test, that's the three things right here. So, and it takes them in order. So the, the first thing you put in goes into the first thing variable in my function, uh, input value. So the first input value is 100. And then the second thing goes into the second item here, input unit. So you put in a C for input unit, capital C. K, it is case sensitive. Um, and then the third thing you put in goes into output unit. So you put in F for output unit. And so these three variables, when I write this first line, um, are assigned 100 C and F. Then the function goes through its algorithm to figure out what to do with all that. So it looks at the input unit first and it figures out uh, it wasn't a K, it wasn't a C, it was an F. So it does this, T equals this uh, equation. And then um, these are all uh, LF, that's else if, in case you didn't get that, but uh, those are else if. And then once it finds a true one, return uh, returns the value, in this case, the value to return is T. And so... It says it just returns T, which is this number right here. Well, I should. Yeah, that was it. <clears throat> and so what happens on these last on this this one down here is the input unit is B. So it goes through. All right, input unit is K. No, C. No, F. No, R. No, else. So if it's not any of these other things, then this thing has to happen. Print your input unit isn't correct. Um, Oh, when you do else if, yeah, that's a way to, um, I don't know if I would call these nested as much as, oh, right, the tabbing, yes, yes, so notice how else if these lines, well, I guess it's just these two, these two lines are indented the exact same amount. If they're not, then um, I don't know if Thani will be kind or not, let's see, they're not indented the same anymore, um, and so you get this kind of error. So expected and indented block. Does it give me a line number? Um, huh, it didn't give me a line. Oh, yeah, here it is right here. Line 19. So otherwise, you got to go dig through everything. So I can go to line 19. Line 19 itself is the uh, problem that's it's not indented. So um, let's tab over. All right, so tab looks like it fixed it. Uh, <laughs> nope, didn't. Oh, that didn't like that. So this is the kind of issues you can get into. Um, with line spaces, I just hit backspace and then I tabbed over and it looks like it's exactly lined up, but. There's something it doesn't like. I wonder if I can have. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I didn't run test. <laughs> I ran custom function. It doesn't do anything. Um, and I just erased it all. And it doesn't have a redo. No, it is. It's control Y. Um, it has a, a control Y is redo because I erased it all. Um, and, and these little asterisks here mean it's not saved in its current state. So we'll save it. Now let's go back to test. All right, yeah, it's working again. All right, now this other one, it does have a correct input unit, but it has D for an output unit, so we can find that error. Um, these are all based on the input units, uh, and then here's some F if statements for the output unit, um, and there's no, no D among those, so there's else, your output unit is, is, is not correct, um, and it returns. Um, and then the actual thing it returns is temp, which is given here. So I kind of said that wrong before. I said it returned T. It returns T, but not to you. It returns T to uh, it's it to get out of the uh, if statements. Uh, and then it enters the next set of if and else ifs where it actually calculates the temperature. Um, and then similar things for the CSV to list and all that kind of stuff. All right.
So a lot of these, like there's a lot of little like split slash in sale, all this kind of stuff. Um, there are a lot of little things going on in here that I don't think are things that we need to try and understand today. Um, most of those look like stuff you could probably figure out. Let's go through a couple of the details here. Um, so the double equal sign versus a single equal sign, I think. Does Arduino use the double equals? I can't remember. It does. Okay, so that's the same, where if you want to do a question, you do double equals. If you want to do an assignment, you do equals. So if you want to assign a value to a variable, it's just a single equal. If you want to test the value of a variable does it equal something it's double equals um let's see what else is in here that might be tricky most of those are just math equations um this is a specific um piece of code to read in a file name so assume you have a uh, csv set of data um, and you want to convert it to a list, then you give it the file name in here and it will read it in and split it up, in this case, based on commas. Um, and that's what this command right here is doing. It's splitting based on there being commas as the splitting element. Um, this, let's see, this looks pretty normal, just if statements. Here's the way to, uh, this is equal, this line right here basically says i equals i plus one. So it's, it's incrementing the variable i. So plus equals one, minus equals one would decrement it, and so forth. Um, I do not expect you to like look through this as fast as we just did and understand everything immediately. Um, but you should be able to use these as references to um, to build the codes that we're going to build this year or this quarter. Um, let's see if we can make that CSV thing work. Um, so let's see what's in here. All right, so this one, all right. So this is uh, that CSV. So we're gonna import our custom functions as a library. So that's the one actually uh, that we just wrote. Well, this is the line that does it, that line. Let's copy it over into the editor. Probably uh, new. Paste. All right, go to the top of it. Um, so this is going to, um, actually it didn't import it. I wonder why it's blanked out. Hmm. Anyway, um, here is an actual file, college football school standings 2018.csv. So we don't have that file, except that um, it gives us right here a web address where we can get that file, or well, we can make that file. So if we go there, you get 2018 college football standings. You get all this data, right? Get all this, all this kind of stuff. And one of the options here, share and more, is to look at this, uh, get the table as CSV for Excel. Now you don't actually get it, you get this. So you get the table, and it's got all the data in it. So what I would do is grab this thing. All right, just it though. Copy, go over to an editor that doesn't add a bunch of fancy stuff. So no pad or something like that. Um, it, if, you try, if you try to put these into something like um, Word, Word, may look like this, but in the background, it's adding a lot of formatting things into the file. Um, and you just want like plain old text. So I just use notepad and I got all of this stuff. If you can't make that work, I did go ahead and get that file and put it, it's actually un it's hidden. Let's see, let's show that. Um, I did get that. I don't remember if it's a CSV file or not. You might have to rename it as .csv because that's what the little piece of code is looking for. So here, if you cut and paste it in the notepad, you can file, save as, uh, whatever that name was. Let's see. Uh, 
CFB school standings 2018.csv. That's the file name that you need this thing to have because that's what it's looking for in your code here. Um, so, well, actually, let's copy that so I don't have to retype it. Uh, that, control C, and then file. My computer's getting a little bit slow. Save as. I want to put this in the same folder that my other stuff is in. So I have a 382 uh, in class. Put it in there. All right, so now we should have that that file in um, the same folder with our other stuff. Um, it should be in the same. Actually, I haven't saved this yet, so let's save this one. Control A is copy everything. All right, so this is our uh, what is this called? I don't know. All right, so. Let's close some. I've got too many things open here. All right, so might as well leave that one open because it's going to reference. It should reference the uh, CSV to list. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Let's see. No, I think it's just going through and um, well. So these lines down here reference the uh, custom functions things that we currently are not importing. So let's run this and see if anything at all happens. Oh, wow, it did. Um, so it did this, meaningless numbers. All right, so let's include our custom functions and see if it does any more useful stuff. So I erased the comment, the hashtag to uncomment out the custom, Im importing the custom functions as CF. And then I only saw it referenced down here at the bottom right here on some of the outputs. Max index, uh, print, another print, min index. See what happens now. All right, so it, I get all the data again in what this is doing. Let's see what it's doing. So what this thing is doing is we're gonna open and read this file into the script. Um, going to create a list, which we already had, um, put it in variable or an array. Uh, we're going to look through all of the rows in the list. So our original data, do I still have it open? Original data was, well, let's go back to the useful form. Uh, reload the page to return. All right, there we go. So it's basically all of the uh, football Divided by conference, looks like it's all of Division One, and it gives them like their win-loss record, their conference record, points per game, uh, if they were ranked in the polls, whatever SRS is, strength of schedule, um, whatever it was. Um, and our code goes through that data. Now it's in uh, just this list, or well, in this uh, comma-separated value thing, turns it into a list, and goes row by row looking for, what's it looking for? Points per game by offense and defense and the difference between the two. Um, uh oh, my computer has decided to, there we go. Um, this line append means it's creating a uh, new variable, points per game offense, another one called points per game defense. Actually, it created them up here. They're empty to begin with, right? There's nothing in them. It's just the brackets showing nothing in between the brackets, so they're empty lists. And uh, I've got three of them, points per game on offense, defense, and points per game. I think it's the difference in the two of those, it said. Um, append just means find that data point that it's looking for and add it to the end of the list. So there's nothing in the list to start with. So the first one goes in the first spot, then it appends from then on. Um, and then it goes and wants to find the maximum value four points per game, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I end up at the end with basically these, let's see, one, two, three, four, those pieces of data. Well, I get the the whole list, all these numbers here with the negative 0.899, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and then I get the maximum points per game. And this is the differential. Uh, 31.19, uh, you know, 31.2 point difference per game. Uh, the uh, index is um, the position of that. So it's index zero. So I guess we could also print the team. Does this grab team names? I assume it did. They're in here, so it should be in there. Um, so we should be able to actually print the team name that goes with these so that we don't have to, you know, it's team zero. Who is that? Um, who did it end up putting in as a zero or as index position zero? Um, so we have to figure out where it put the team names in. But I think we're kind of, I don't know if I have time to figure that out right now. And we might come back to that um, because I don't see it right now. We would, we would probably have to create one of these that creates a uh, team name parallel list type thing that we could go and reference who is who did who ended up being team zero. Um, oh, this poor team at negative 28.2 uh, lost by a good margin every game, and they were number 19 in the list. All right. So maybe next time we'll go in and how and write some code on how to make these actually um, have the names associated with them, who they are, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that would probably be a good good uh, exercise to actually code from scratch. Um, I did link these two. If you're really worried about the writing stuff in Python, here's some different tutorial sites that uh, might help. Um, most of what you're going to write in this course in Python is going to be pretty... Uh, guided, like you're not going to have to write too many things from scratch, and the stuff you write from scratch will be relatively straightforward. Um, and the, the way the class is set up, uh, the end of every class should be kind of a lab type setting where you can get help with coding and things like that, if, if or whatever you happen to need help with at the time. Um, all right, so I think for today we we've, we've talked enough about this stuff. Get your Python up and running. Make sure that you actually have it uh, working and get those kits so that we can do some soldering and some actual data collecting maybe next week.